Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. Today, Dr. Walensky will provide an update on Omicron. Dr. Fauci will present the latest science, and Dr. Murphy will discuss Pfizer's vaccine application for kids under the age of five. And then I'll cover operational planning so that we're ready for that age group. With that, over to Dr. Walensky. Dr. Walensky. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon. I'd like to start by walking you through today's data. The current seven-day daily average of cases is about 446,400 cases per day, a decrease of about 36% over the previous week. The seven-day average of hospital admissions is about 17,100 per day, also a decrease of about 14% over the previous week. And the seven-day average daily deaths are about 2,300 per day, which is an increase of about 4% over the prior week. While we continue to see large decreases in average daily case counts across the country, hospitalizations remain high, stretching our healthcare capacity and workforce to its limits in some areas of the country. And daily deaths also remain quite high. And with the mixed news above, similar to other waves during the pandemic, our data continue to reinforce the critical importance of vaccination. Last week, I shared data from our surveillance studies demonstrating the effectiveness of vaccination, including boosters, on decreasing cases, emergency department visits, and hospitalizations. Additional new data continue to support these findings. On this slide, you can see data from 25 U.S. jurisdictions that report cases and deaths linked to vaccination status. Similar to what I showed you last week, vaccination and booster doses substantially decrease the risk of death from COVID-19. Looking at the data from the week ending December 4th, the number of average weekly deaths for those who were unvaccinated was 9.7 per 100,000 people, but only 0.7 per 100,000 people for those who were vaccinated. This means the risk of dying from COVID-19 was 14 times higher for people who were unvaccinated compared to those who received only a primary series. For those who were boosted, the average of weekly deaths was 0.1 per 100,000 people, meaning that unvaccinated individuals were 97 times more likely to die compared to those who were boosted. I also want to share new data from CDC's COVIDnet hospital surveillance network to further show how essential vaccination and boosting is in preventing hospitalization from COVID-19. On this slide, you can see data comparing the percentage of people age 65 and older who are unvaccinated and boosted in the general population in blue and those who are hospitalized in green. As shown on the slide, only 12% of those age 65 and over remain unvaccinated in the general population. But when we look at those over the age of 65 who are in the hospital for COVID-19, 54% are unvaccinated. In stark contrast, now let's look at those who have been boosted on the bottom. Here, 57% of those over age 65 are boosted in the general population and only 8% of those over the age of 65 and in the hospital for COVID-19 have received a booster dose. These same trends are seen across all age groups. These data show us that the percent of people who are currently hospitalized due to COVID-19 are disproportionately unvaccinated and disproportionately not boosted. Additionally, these data confirm that vaccination and boosting continue to protect against severe illness and hospitalization even during the Omicron surge. If you are not up to date on your COVID-19 vaccinations, you have not optimized your protection against severe disease and death, and you should get vaccinated and boosted if you are eligible. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Dr. Walensky. What I'd like to do over the next couple of minutes is to address a common misperception and the result of misinformation. And that is whether vaccination negatively impacts people trying to conceive, namely, does it have a negative impact on fertility? The data are clear. Next slide. I will show a couple of representative studies. This published just a week and a half ago 
in the American Journal of Epidemiology, which is a prospective cohort study of vaccination and SARS infection and fertility. The study is an NIH funded pregnancy study online or presto for short of couples who are trying to conceive through intercourse. It enrolled participants before pregnancy and collected data on vaccination and other variables during the preconception period, and then collected data on subsequent fertility. There were over 2000 females between the ages of 21 and 45 in the US or Canada. They were enrolled between December 2020 and September 2021, and they were followed through November 2021. Next slide. The data are clear. COVID-19 vaccination in male or female partners did not affect the likelihood of conception. Couples were 18% less likely to conceive if the male partner had been infected with SARS-CoV-2 within 60 days before a menstrual cycle. That is infected, not vaccinated. However, COVID-19 disease only temporarily reduced male fertility. Next slide. In another study published again about a week and a half ago, this was in an in vitro fertilization clinic. And the question that was asked that were people vaccinated in this case, either with the Pfizer or the Moderna product, had similar responses to ovarian stimulation, which is used to stimulate the ovary in preparation for in vitro fertilization. And similar pregnancy outcomes compared with unvaccinated people. The reproductive potential does not appear to be affected by vaccination, in people who undergo in vitro fertilization. Next slide. So what's our takeaway message about vaccination and conception? New data add to previous studies that indicate that COVID-19 vaccination does not negatively impact fertility. CDC and professional medical organizations serving people of reproductive age emphasize, as shown on this website, that there's no evidence that vaccination impairs fertility. And of course, as we've all said over and over again, vaccination is recommended for people who are trying to get pregnant now or might become pregnant in the future, as well as their partners. And anyone who's vaccinated and pregnant, breastfeeding, trying to get pregnant now, or might become pregnant in the future, should also get a booster shot when eligible. Final slide, the message is the same. Get vaccinated and get boosted for so many reasons. Now over to you, Dr. Murthy. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Fauci. And it's good to be with everyone again today. As many of you know, the FDA has now received Pfizer's application for a vaccine for children aged six months through four years. Now, Jeff is gonna talk more about how we're preparing for the possibility of this milestone. But first, I wanna walk you through the process. Pfizer's application will now undergo the same independent, rigorous, and transparent review process that was used to authorize the vaccines that now more than 250 million Americans have received, including millions of children ages five and up. It will involve the FDA receiving the full data from Pfizer, posting that data publicly, and then convening its advisory committee for a transparent discussion of the data. The FDA will then render its opinion, after which the CDC and its advisory group will assess the data and make their recommendation. This is the same rigorous process that was used to assess numerous vaccines long before the pandemic began. I know how eager parents and caregivers are for the good news on this front. For much of this pandemic, millions of parents have carried with them an added layer of worry knowing that their children under five didn't have protection from COVID the way older vaccinated children do. I felt this worry too, as the father of a four-year-old daughter who is not yet eligible to get vaccinated. That's why I'm hopeful that we may be one step closer to having an added layer of protection for our younger children and one less worry for their parents. A vaccine for children under five would mean we would have vaccines available for essentially all age groups in America. This would be a major milestone. Now, there are a number of steps ahead to determine if the vaccine is both safe and effective for our kids under five. 
And please know that the FDA will not cut any corners in their review process. They know that they are the gold standard that all of us rely on. If and when the FDA and CDC decide to move forward, we will work closely with our trusted community partners to ensure that families have accurate science-based information about the vaccine so that they can make the best decisions for their children. And as we await this review process, I wanna emphasize once more just how important it is that the rest of us get vaccinated and get our kids five and older who are already eligible vaccinated as well. If you are 12 and up and you're vaccinated, please get boosted as soon as you're eligible. And all of us should wear high quality masks when in public indoor settings. This is how we can continue to create a wall of protection around our children under five as we look to safeguard their health. Thanks so much for your time today. I'll pass it to Jeff. Well, thanks doctors. Um, if the FDA authorizes and CDC recommends this vaccine, 18 million children under the age of five will become eligible for protection from COVID-19. Before we open up for questions, I wanna share how we're preparing now, just as we did with vaccines for kids ages five to 11, so that we are ready and we hit the ground running following decisions from FDA and CDC. Importantly, this vaccine is specifically formulated for kids under the age of five. So we're working closely with states, local health departments, pediatricians, families, doctors, and pharmacies to ensure the vaccine is available at thousands of locations nationwide. We've already secured ample doses and the necessary needles and supplies specially made for kids in this age group. Following FDA authorization, we would immediately begin packing and shipping doses to states and healthcare providers. And in short order, following CDC recommendations, parents will be able to get their kids under five vaccinated at convenient locations, locations they know and trust. While we know many parents are eager to get their kids the protection of the vaccine, we know others have questions. So we're working with our partners to ensure all parents have access to the facts and information they need to make the right decision. And as always, we're laser focused on equity and making sure we reach the hardest hit and most at risk communities and families. A year ago, we stood up a historic nationwide vaccination program that's now gotten 75% adults in the US fully vaccinated. We then launched a boosters program that's gotten almost 90 million Americans their booster shot. And we established a vaccination program specifically for kids ages five to 11 that has protected millions of kids around the country. Now with a potential vaccine for kids under five on the horizon, our message to parents and families is simple. We're doing everything we can to prepare now we're taking all of the best practices and applying all the lessons learned over the last 12 months to ensure getting kids under five, the protection of vaccine is easy and convenient. And we'll be ready to start getting shots in arms soon after FDA and CDC make their decisions. With that, let's open it up for some questions. Kevin. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Please keep your questions to one. Uh, first, let's go to Laura Santhanim at PBS. Thanks so much. Can, um, thinking about uh, long COVID treatment, can you tell me uh, just sort of uh, latest updates with uh, with research about uh, treatment availability and, um, and and accreditation of clinics offering that treatment? Dr. Fauci, long COVID treatments. Yeah, there is a very large study that's been initiated some time ago, um, the Recover study. Uh, at the NIH in collaboration with other agencies, looking at the incidence, the prevalence, and hopefully understanding the pathogenic mechanisms of long COVID. Right now, the data are starting to come in. It's too early to make any definitive statements, but for those individuals, and as you know, long COVID means the persistence of signs and symptoms that are not explainable by any ready, readily recognizable pathogenic process following the recovery from the acute infection. There have been subject, some suggestions that it is an aberrant inflammatory response, perhaps some element of autoimmunity, perhaps some element of persistence of nucleotide fragments from the virus. All of these now 
are being actively pursued. But before we can make any definitive statements, we need to learn a lot more about it with the ultimate goal of figuring out how we might be able to mitigate or prevent some of those symptoms. Thank you. Next question, please. Let's go to Jeff Mason at Reuters. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is about the, the data and about habits. Uh, with regard to data, for Dr. Fauci or, or Dr. Walensky, what is your take on why the booster rate seems to be lagging? Why would people who have decided to get vaccinated, first and second doses, not be getting more boosters? And, and secondly, with regard to your, uh, the, the, data, the data today with cases going down and hospitalizations going down, Dr. Lewinsky, Walensky, do you think people uh, should start to change their habits and it's okay now to maybe gather in groups more to go out to bars and restaurants or what is the overall guidance right now in terms of um, in terms of gathering in groups hey jeff this is jeff why don't we just start with the baseline on where we are in the booster data um, and that is that uh, about half of all americans who are eligible for a booster have gotten a booster eligibility is five months or greater for the mrna vaccines pfizer and Moderna and two months for J&J. &J. And importantly, about 70% of seniors, those over 65, have gotten a booster. As you know, boosters are widely available. They're at convenient locations around the country and they're free. And obviously the, the impact of a booster, as Dr. Walensky said, is really important. So we obviously wanna to continue to drive that number higher and higher, the percent of Americans who have boosters. But over to you, Dr. Fauci, and then over to you, Dr. Walensky. Well, Jeff, you know, I, I'm really not sure you're asking a good question. It's almost a psychological, sociological question. Why were people who had enough uh, understanding of the risk to go ahead and get the primary series, why we don't have more getting the booster? I don't have an easy explanation for that. That's one of the reasons why we keep trying to put the data out. Because as Dr. Walensky showed in her slide, the data are really stunningly obvious why a booster is really very important. You first need to get vaccinated before you get boosted, that's for sure. But when you look at the difference of how booster for everything you ask it to do, to reconstitute from an immunological and from a clinical standpoint, the diminished protection that you get not only with waning, naturally of immunity, but also the negative impact on some of the variants that elude the immune response. Fortunately for us, when you boost with the standard vaccine, which is against the original viral sequence, that you get such a good response. So the only thing that we can do is to continue to come out with the data and to make sure the American public appreciates why it is so important for optimal protection to get boosted. Dr. Walensky. And, and maybe I'll just add in there um, with regard to where cases and hospitalizations are, I think we are all cautiously optimistic as we're seeing cases come down week over week, down 36% over the last week. Um, I do think we have to use an important metric as a barometer, which is how are our hospitals doing? And our hospitalization rates are still quite high and certainly um, having hospital capacity challenges in many parts of the country still. So with that barometer, um, we've said before, Omicron Omicron milder does not mean mild. And so we really do have to look to our hospitalization rates and our death rates to look to when is time to lift some of these mitigation efforts. We will continue to reevaluate and we know people are anxious. Next question, please. Let's go to Jeannie Bauman at Bloomberg. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, I was hoping, Jeff, you could be a little bit more, um, when you said short order for the availability of those kids' vaccines, where you mean, I was hoping, do you mean like a week or a few days? And then Dr. Fauci, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the pandemic preparedness um, plan that NAAID released today and you know how the lessons from COVID helped drive some of those plans and, and what type of funding do you need um, to implement it? So thank you. Yeah, so uh, on the, um vaccines for kids under five. Uh, we're doing all the preparation now uh, that we can do 
to be ready so that it'll be available at trusted locations uh, as soon as possible. Uh, post, I want to emphasize again, FDA and CDC recommendations, uh, we cannot begin actually packing and shipping until the FDA authorization. And then there's the CDC ACIP process, which generally takes place a matter of days after the FDA. Uh, so we're talking, um, you know, a matter of uh, several days to a week or so uh, based on the five to 11 year experience of from FDA authorization uh, to when the first doses will start to be shots in arms, but will move as fast as possible pending the decision of CDC and FDA. And I think the preparation we're doing now will enable us to do so. The second part of your question. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that, Jeff. She was asking about the pandemic preparedness plan. You know, very briefly, Jeannie, it is really uh, founded on what we've been talking about for some time now, which is the prototype pathogen approach where you get fundamental information, data, and preparedness on each of the multiple families that are projected to be as a risk. For example, fortunately for us, we had been doing that with the coronaviruses when we got a lot of information from SARS-CoV-1 and MERS and were already involved in the preparation of both platform technology and immunogen design. We plan to do that by selecting out anywhere from 10 to 20 families of viruses in which we can find common denominators within the family and do the immunological background to do the development of phase one type vaccines so that we could hit the, the ground running. The second part of the program relates to both the development and the discovery of antiviral drugs. Those that are already around, namely have been used for other purposes that we might apply them to whatever of the families that I mentioned a moment ago. But the other is to use the replication cycle of the virus is similar to what we did with HIV and what we're doing with COVID-19 to be able to develop antivirals against the whole family. That's just kind of a snapshot of the plan that the NIH just recently put out. With regard to the budget, I mean, obviously it's too early to talk about that because we're in negotiations right now for what our budgetary needs are. Thank you. Next question, please. Let's go to Meg Torell at CNBC. Thanks. Um, one for Dr. Fauci and one for Dr. Walensky. Um, for Dr. Fauci, are you expecting we'll see an efficacy update with the data for kids under five? I think a lot of parents are just unsure about how optimistic they should be feeling right now um, when the last update we got was that the immunobridging study didn't meet goals. So are you expecting to see that we'll actually see this prevent cases of COVID? Um, and then for Dr. Walensky, can you give us an update on BA2, its prevalence and your expectation for how it could affect sort of the curve of this Omicron wave? Yeah, Meg, thank you. I mean, obviously we are anticipating that we will get a good efficacy signal for the use of vaccines in children under five years old. But right now, as you know, the FDA is looking at the data very carefully and in their typical fashion, they will be very careful in scrutinizing the data and making a recommendation and the decision based on that data. So I don't wanna get ahead of them, but of course we're anticipating we will get a vaccine efficacy signal that would allow for the use of this vaccine in children. But let's wait for the FDA determination and ultimately the CDC recommendation. Dr. Walensky. Yeah, great. Um, thank you, Meg, for that question. So um, our genomic surveillance now is detecting BA2, um, projecting around 1.5% in this country. Of course, that varies for different parts of the country, but around 1.5% one one projection of the sequences that we're seeing. What we know about BA2 so far is that it does have a modest transmission advantage over BA1. However, it's not nearly the transmission advantage that we've seen between Omicron and Delta. In terms of early studies, we have not seen any studies that suggest it's more severe, um, nor have we seen studies that suggest that it will evade our vaccines any more so than Omicron has already. And in fact, that our vaccines will work just like it has with Omicron. Um, 
so, so in terms of how we anticipate this will uh, impact cases, in many places we've seen BA2 so far, um, cases have continued to come down, although at a slower rate. In some case, in some countries like Denmark, um, cases have gone up associated with BA2, but that's also in the context of relaxing mitigation strategies, mitigation measures, which is why we're currently keeping those in place, among the reasons. Jackson, I had oh, Please one point to make a question. Meg, at the heart of your question, I think is something that many parents may be wondering about, which is what's changed between December when Pfizer uh, shared their news and, and now. And there is a big change that's happened, which is we experienced the Omicron surge. And with many children in particular, uh, as well as adults being infected and ending up in the hospital during the Omicron surge, it turns out that has actually facilitated the collection of more of important clinical data, additional clinical data that we did not have in December. Uh, whether that changes the risk benefit profile is what the FDA will be assessing. Uh, but there has been developments since December on the data front. Next question, please. So Jacqueline Howard at CNN. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I understand that earlier this week, governors who met with the president expressed that they were seeking more clear guidelines from the White House on what the transition out of the pandemic and into a greater state of normality might look like. Um, obviously, I know we're not quite there yet, but my question is, when might we see such guidance? And can you give us any insight into if and how those guidelines will be prepared, what metrics will be considered, and how will that guidance be communicated to state leaders and to the public? Thank you. Paul, well, as, as you can see from the discussion today, right now, our focus is on fighting Omicron. Um, while cases are coming down, as Dr. Walensky pointed out, there's still a high level of hospitalization, largely driven, uh, as the data shows, by the unvaccinated. At the same time, uh, we are always you know, planning for the future. The most important thing that we have uh, now, when comparing to a year ago, um, are the tools to protect people, the vaccines and, and the effectiveness that we've talked about, particularly with boosters that offer the highest, highest level of protection, a pediatric vaccine um, on the horizon, and treatments, including pills uh, that are highly effective against severe disease and hospitalization. So we are in a much stronger position than a year ago. Uh, we have 210 million people fully vaccinated, including 75 percent, three out of four of every adult. Uh, we had less than a percent uh, a, when the president took office a year ago, people vaccinated. So from 1 percent up to 75 percent of adults, 98, 99 percent of schools are open. That number was 46 percent when the president took office. We have free tests, free masks and booster shots widely available. So our progress over the last year and the tools we now have certainly allow us to get closer to a time when COVID doesn't disrupt our daily lives, but is something we protect against and treat. And as we make uh, more progress against Omicron, uh, we'll you know, get closer to that point. Next question, please. Go to Z, and thank you. Um, thanks. I just uh, was wanted to follow up on uh, Jeff's last point there, uh, and maybe get the doctor's input as well. In terms of that pathway to that vision of of a point where COVID nineteen doesn't alter Americans' daily lives, you know, for many over the past couple of years, it feels a little bit like you know they're, they're Charlie Brown in football here, where it's you know get vaccinated and uh, no, but now you need to get a booster. But even if you're vaccinated and boosted, you still need to wear your mask to protect people who, who aren't vaccinated. Is there a sense yet that you can offer the American public based upon your studies, based upon what you now know about Omicron? You know, is this the last wave? Is there enough that you can say by a point certain COVID will not impact people's daily lives anymore? And, and if not, you know, why not? What else do you need to know? Dr. Fauci? Well, we have to be totally honest that we don't know. We're, we believe that we are now going in the right direction. And the best case scenario, as I and my colleagues have often described, is that with the tools that we have, the vaccination, the boosting, the testing, the masking, and all the other mitigations that we know about, when you have a level of 
community protection, which is the level of immunity throughout the community, that we will reach a stage, and I hope that it's sooner rather than later, when, as you have said, this will not dominate our lives. In other words, it will be similar to the assimilation of this virus in the group of viruses that we have learned to live with without disruption of our society. You know, the RSVs, the parainfluenzas, the influenzas, where it's there, it's present, it hasn't been eradicated, it hasn't been eliminated, but it isn't at a, at a level that it essentially dominates what we do and dramatically influences our lives. We believe we will get there. We can't guarantee that there will not be another variant that challenges us, but the best that we can do with that is to be prepared for it. And that's why we're doing all the things that we're doing with regard to getting better, more um, the advanced vaccine, for example, different platforms, different immunogen designs, development and discovery of new drugs, all of that will be part of the armamentarium that will ultimately, even with the appearance of additional variants, will get us to the point where we will not be dominated by this virus, where we can return to a degree of normality that we all crave for. Please. All right, time for a couple more questions. Let's go to Cheryl Stolberg at the New York Times. Thanks for um, taking this question. It's for Jeff and for Dr. Fauci. Um, Senators Murray and Burr have proposed a legislation that would create a task force to examine the initial emergence of the coronavirus and also assess the United States response across both the Trump and Biden administrations. Um, it would be appointed by Congress, not by the White House. And I'm wondering to Jeff, is this something that the president supports? And for Dr. Fauci, do you think it's necessary to conduct an inquiry into the origins of the virus? Well, Cheryl, thanks for the, the question. I'd start with, you know, we share the senator's focus. A lot of the bill um, is about building stronger public health systems. And we appreciate the bipartisan goals to ensure the country's better prepared uh, for outbreaks uh, in the future like COVID. Right now, as we've been talking about, our, our you know, focus is 100% on fighting Omicron and COVID. And while cases are coming down, the hospitalizations, as we discussed, are, are, are still quite high. Um, and across time, uh, we do look forward to engaging with Congress and reviewing lessons learned from this pandemic uh, so I think that uh, right now our focus is on Omicron, uh, but we appreciate the, the work the senators have done and look forward to working with them. Dr. Fauci. Yeah, Cheryl, I think it's important to look at every aspect of this outbreak for lessons learned. That is not only what the origin of the virus and the origin of the outbreak is, but many other things that we could learn from in the future so that we can prevent something like this happening or respond better if and when it does. One of those is understanding what the origin of the virus is. And it's very important. For example, studies were done with the first SARS-CoV-1 that we experienced in 2002 and 2003. And there was a mystery about how that happened. And then finally, after a lot of studies that actually took years to finally show that the origin was from a bat to an intermediate host to a human, very likely, in a wet market type situation. That was very important because that led to things that unfortunately were not followed, namely a better control and regulation of the wild animal trade and the interface between humans and animals. The other one was mares in which it was shown finally that this was a bat reservoir that very likely infected camels and camels to human. That also provides public health guidelines for the interaction of an animal-human interface. So it would be obviously important to be able to determine how this went from what was very likely an animal reservoir, given the similarity with bat viruses, how that happened to go into humans to lead to this outbreak. Understanding that will help us to prepare for any future outbreak as well as prepare for a response. So I'm definitely in favor of that. 
Kevin. Last question. Let's go to Peter Sullivan, the Hill. Hi, thanks. Um, there's a group of Democrats in Congress have called for $17 billion in the next appropriations package for global vaccinations and other aspects of the global response. I'm, I'm wondering if the White House supports that, and are, are you planning to you know, ask Congress for that in the next package? Thanks. So we have um, what we need in this current fight against Omicron, uh, and we've done a lot to prepare for what's ahead. We have boosters for all Americans. We've secured 20 million doses of the highly effective Pfizer pill. We've expanded supplies and stockpiles of PPE, including masks and gloves. Uh, so while we have enough money, enough funding uh, for the current immediate needs, we need to continue, as we've talked about, to stay ahead of the virus. And we are looking at a future where we will likely need funding for treatments and pills. We'll need funding to uh, continue to expand testing and to continue to lead the effort uh, as we've done with 1.2 billion doses donated to the world, but to continue to lead that effort to vaccinate the, wo the world. So we will be working with Congress as needed to make sure we have the funding to continue to fight this virus. I want to uh, thank everybody for the questions and look forward to the next briefing. Thank you.